Hello and welcome everyone to this presentation of Subborn Channels, which is joint work with Zeta Varikyoti and myself. Subborn Channels are about an uh, defining and analyzing time lock bribing attacks over Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and blockchains. So, first of all, let's introduce time locks. This is a typical Bitcoin transaction with one input and one output. And in the output, we can see that the one, in order to spend the output, they need to present a signature, sigma, and uh, they have to wait for a time lock. So, essentially, they cannot publish a transaction before this time lock expires. So, why would one want to lock their coins? That's a good question, and let's see a toy example. An example is when a parent wants to create a savings account for their child. What they do in this case is that they transfer the current money to an output that is time locked far into the future so that they themselves cannot use the money and they have to wait for the time lock to expire. Of course, this story example is not the best uh, application. It's not fully robust because you would want in practice some way to get your money back. And of course, you would want some um, security from losing the keys because if you put the time lock too far into the future, it is quite possible that one loses the keys. So, to go into a more realistic um, application of time locks, let's introduce payment channels. So, in this case, Alice and Bob have some coins on chain, some Bitcoin, and they know that in the future they will be transacting a lot. And they know also that each transaction on chain costs a lot of money in fees and is very slow to be confirmed. It takes more or less an hour and possibly more. So what they do is that they open a channel. How do they open a channel? They create together a funding transaction which takes all their money and puts them into a one output. You can think of it as a joint account. However, each party holds on to a commitment transaction which they can unilaterally use in order to close the channel, spend the funding output and close the channel and each will take their right share of the money. And then they can create new commitment transactions when they want to pay each other. So commitment transactions are not put on chain uh, initially, they are only put, uh, only one commitment transaction is put on chain when the channel closes. So that means that the parties, in order to create new commitment transactions and store them, they just have to communicate with each other and not with anyone else. So paying is extremely fast because they just have to communicate between them. The, the, the network latency is the only thing that creates uh, delays and this is quite fast. And the fee is zero because they don't have to pay anyone else. And uh, so each version of the commitment transaction represents the new state of the channel with different balances for the two parties. So um, this creates a very nice solution for the problem that we described before. How now does the channel close? Let's see how this connects to the blockchain. Here, uh, the funding transaction has been put in a very old block possibly. And then uh, this is specific for lightning channels. Alice wants to... Um, to close her channel. So she publishes a commitment transaction. Um, should she be able to take her coins right away? The answer is no. Why is that? Because maybe she is malicious and she publishes an old commitment transaction, which does not correspond to the current channel state. In order to prevent from this kind of attack, the, her coins, when she publishes a commitment transaction, are locked for a dispute period. This dispute period is enforced with the use of time blocks. During this period, Bob can publish a revocation transaction, well as suitably crafted, to punish Alice and take all her money and give them to Bob. So in this way, Alice is disincentivized from publishing any old commitment transaction because Bob will then be able to punish her. Instead, if she publishes the most common, uh, the most recent commitment transaction, Bob does not own a revocation transaction that corresponds to that one. So he cannot uh, take advantage of this dispute period and the dispute period will end and then uh, Alice will be able to take her money using a subsequent transaction. How do time looks look in Lightning? Well, focusing on this specific commitment transaction in the middle, we see that the upper output, which 
corresponds to the coins that Alice owns, can be spent in two ways. Either with Alice's signature Sigma Alpha after a time lock, and this corresponds to the lower transaction in the right, which is uh, named payout to Alpha. And um, the other way to spend this output is by uh, using the revocation transaction, which uh, only B, Bob, can publish. And of course, uh, Bob has a revocation transaction for every old commitment transaction. Uh, so in this uh, particular example, if the lower hated commitment transaction I plus one is the latest one, then Bob does not own a revocation transaction for that one, but for all previous ones, including the one that is highlighted. So this, however, um, has a, a very specific assumption in mind that when Bob publishes the revocation transaction, this will be included in one of the very uh, in the, the next block or one of the blocks that comes soon after, and essentially that the miners will actively include the revocation transaction. However, this may not necessarily be the case if the miners are not honest. And in practice, miners are more likely to be rational, wanting to maximize their coins, than to play along and to include all the transactions that they see. Uh, so in practice, miners may prefer to ignore the revocation transaction and instead wait for the time lock to expire and add instead the payout transaction, which will, um, will give the money to Alice instead. And they will do that if the payout transaction gives them a much bigger uh, fee than the revocation transaction. So this situation gives rise to a game theoretic game. Um, so in this case, we have two outputs. One, uh, we have actually one output with two spending conditions. One of the two can be used. The condition one is not time locked and can be used right away. And the condition two is time locked. And it, you would have to wait for the time to expire before using it. So this output is on chain and there are two transactions, TX1 and TX2, which float in the mempool, i.e. they are trying to be added to the blockchain. These two transactions are mutually exclusive and both try to spend the output O. The TX1 spends the output uh, using the non-time locked method, the condition one, and the TX2 spends the output with condition two, so it is only valid after the time lock T expires. So for the miner, the, the miner has a dilemma. Each miner that tries to mine this block has a dilemma. Given that uh, both transactions have a nice uh, hefty fee, the question for them is whether to mine transaction one now or ignore it and wait for transaction two to become valid after time T expires and then attempt to mine that one. In this game, the miner, the only action that they have to choose is whether to ignore a transaction or not. So this, uh, this game does not include, does not demand from the miner to divert the mining power to um, different chains that could be possibly unprofitable or other kinds of shenanigans like that, which are needed from other bribing scenarios in uh, similar uh, lines of work. And this essentially means that uh, accepting this bribe for the miner is risk-free because they will not uh, spend their uh, mining power for nothing. Then they will not be punished if they do not succeed in the time of game. They will just gain a few, uh, a little less fees, uh, but they will not lose completely the opportunity of mining a valid block. So this is a much more relevant and crucial attack to defend against. So our main theorem uh, is in this form. Let's say that the miner has again the TX1 and TX2, each having fee F1 and F2 respectively, and every unrelated transaction on the block on the mempool has a fee F. So you can consider these transactions are as transactions that could replace completely both TX1 and TX2. In our scenario, we don't mark it here, but we assume that F1 and F2 are both larger than so that it makes sense for a miner to include either TX1 or TX2 instead of some unrelated transaction. And uh, we also note, uh, we also use the notation lambda min to, to mark the uh, proportion of mining power that the weakest miner has. 
and this goes from zero when the miner has no mining power all the way to one when there is a single mining miner uh, for the entire network and uh, so our result says that if the fee of the time lock transaction is much much higher than the fee of the non time locked one then it is a Nash equilibrium for every miner to ignore transaction one not included in a block and instead wait for the time lock of transaction two to expire and try to include that one which has this much larger fee and crucially here the, the thing that is missing from the equation on, from the inequality on the left is the time lock duration so this is quite counterintuitive but it is the case that no matter how long the time lock is it does make sense for the miner to um, ignore the, the the currently valid transaction uh, if the fee of the other transaction is big enough um, this is um, this is within a rational model which does not discount the future so let's apply our theorem to various payment channels constructions so the first construction that we will focus on is duplex micropayment channels this is a predecessor to uh, lightning channels and uh, the idea here is that uh, the two parties when they open the channel they each have five coins let's say in this example and they uh, publish this great transaction on chain which has a single output with uh, the sum of the two parties coins they also generate this refund transaction which is time locked with 100 uh, units of time and they hold on to this transaction of chain this transaction when the time lock expires they can publish it and it will take their initial share of money if they want to pay the other party then they can generate the update transaction marked here with a time lock of 99 and as you can see essentially the blue player pays one coin to the green player and the green player takes it upon them to publish the uh, update transaction right when the time lock of 99 steps expires if they are late to publish it then the other transaction the refund transaction with a higher time lock will also become valid and if the blue player manages to publish the uh, refund transaction first instead of the update transaction the result will be that uh, the payment will be void and this is something that um, the, the green party would not like to happen the problem here is that um, as you can see the channel from the get-go has a limited lifetime and each update brings this lifetime even lower so there's a trade-off between how many updates to do and uh, how much larger to uh, make the channel and of course if you set the initial time lock too far into the future then you lock the coins for too much time so uh, the actual duplex micropayment channel structure is, is resembles a tree and parties in this situation can, um, I, I won't go into details how it's done, but the main idea is that they intelligently reduce the time lock of a specific branch of the tree by creating the uh, relevant new transactions in a way that ensures that um, many, many um, update transactions can be made. So that means many payments can be carried out. And at the same time, the maximum possible time lock is not too large. Uh, the, uh, the trade-off here is that the party that closes the channel has to publish many transactions on chain, as many as the depth of the tree, instead of just one. So, we apply the analysis of the previous theorem on DMC channels, and we uh, let CR2 be the coins of the second player in the refund transaction, in the initial state of the channel, and this transaction would have fee FR. And let's see you two be the um, fans of the play of player two again in the latest update transaction with a fee FU. And let all unrelated transactions again have a fee of F and lambda mean be the share of the weakest miner. Our result, applying our theorem, uh, actually uh, our theorem as I presented it to you uh, was slightly simplified compared to the theorem that we present in our paper. So here we, we apply the complex version of the theorem. That's why this two of the uh, numerator of the um, fraction appears. Uh, so applying our theorem, we have this result, which essentially says that if the difference between the initial coins of the party 
and the final conscience of the party is too big, then the party it is rational for the party to attempt to bribe. So the attacker would uh, would be able to use the extra money that they would they would gain from uh, the refund transaction ending up on chain, and use this, they would use this money to uh, bribe the miners in order to uh, incentivize them to uh, ignore the latest update transaction for long enough so that the refund transaction time block expires. So this is how the uh, DMC transactions look like. I won't go into details how they work exactly, but uh, what I want to focus on is how we change them. So what we add is essentially some hash locks. Hash locks are a way for the Bitcoin script to demand the disclosure of a pre-image uh, to a particular hash when a particular output is going to be spent. So going, for example, in the output that uh, is on the uh, refund transaction on the right, the highest one, uh, party A would have to show their signature, but also the pre-image to a specific hash that is attached to this output. So the transaction on the right need both the signature and the hash. The transaction on the left instead, on the bottom left, would need either a signature or a hash. And the idea here is the following, that if you know the pre-image to the hash on, uh, on the left, you can spend the transaction without needing to know any signature. So if a, a miner knows this pre-image, then they will take this money for themselves. And the idea here is that if you publish um, a way to spend this refund or update transactions too early, the ones on the right, then you will have to disclose a particular hash, a particular pre-image to a hash, and this particular pre-image could be useful for the miner to take the coins from the other update transaction. And so this means that the, the defender would use some of the coins of the attacker to counter bribe the miners effectively increasing the coins that the, the briber would need to pay as a fee. And uh, when we apply the, the analysis of the, our main theorem to our suborn channels, we get a different inequality for when bribing is rational, which essentially increases the range of, um, sorry, decreases the range of possible uh, bribing behavior. And we, by doing some calculations, we show that the, the, the amount of money that has to be uh, left within the channel to prevent bribing is uh, much smaller than in the plain DMC construction. Essentially, in the plain DMC construction, you need to allow a little bit of money within the channel so that, um, that bribing is impossible. Here, the amount of money that you need to leave in the channel can be as little as low as 30 times smaller. This means that more money is freed up for real use and uh, less money is needed to prevent, to sit there just to prevent possible uh, attacks. So moving on to applying our theorem again to Lightning, which is more relevant for uh, today since Lightning is operational on Bitcoin. So. This is the construction of Lightning, how it currently works with the funding, commitment, and revocation transactions. And uh, our analysis, um, up, we apply again the same logic and we come up with this result. So here, the coins that uh, currently are honestly owned by the attackers are CNU. And uh, the, the attacker can put this transaction on chain with a fee of F, uh, can take this coin with a fee of F. This is essentially uh, pessimistic in the sense that possibly this uh, commitment transaction has a bigger fee, but we reduce this fee to F, which is the same fee as unrelated transactions have to pay, well, pay really, so that we maximize the range of possible attacks in order to, to be uh, pessimistic and prevent against all attacks. So C old, on the other hand, is the, um, the coins that the adversary holds on to uh, in a previous commitment transaction, essentially the version of the channel with the maximum coins for the attacker. And this transaction has a fee of FR. Um, and this has been agreed upon in the past. Lambda min again is the share of the weakest miner. 
So again, the result is similar to previous cases. And what we see is that if um, the, the difference between the maximum coins of the adversary, of the bad guy, of the attacker, uh, and the current uh, coins that it should own is too big, uh, then bribing is rational. In order to uh, improve the situation, we uh, propose this slight change to Lightning Channels, where when a party uh, publishes a revocation transaction, instead of keeping all the money of the attacker uh, for themselves, they use some of this money, uh, essentially F prime R coins, and they give them to anyone. This can be as a, as a literal output or just as reducing the output of, um, of their own coins, and the rest are implicitly used as fees. So the party should go on and calculate how, how much F prime R should be. And we do this calculation, applying our analysis again, and we come up with these two, these two inequalities. And if these two inequalities hold, then uh, bribing is impossible. So if the party, if the defender can find uh, a value F' R such that uh, the first inequality holds, and their, uh, their view of how much uh, lambda min is, um, is, is, is valid, then uh, they can actually um, decide how much coins to give to the miners from the punishment, from the revocation transaction, in order to make bribing completely possible. So the strategy of an honest party would be whenever their counterparty proposes um, a payment, they should check that at the end of the payment, these two inequalities can hold. It is possible for these uh, inequalities to remain true. If these inequalities remain true, then the defender, the honest party, is uh, protected against any bribing attack. Also, a nice feature of this uh, st structure is that um, this fee, F prime R, does not have to be decided when the revocation transaction is created. Instead, it can be decided later by uh, respending the revocation transaction and giving part of these coins to the miners. Uh, this is very useful in practice because maybe the, the time that the revocation transaction is generated could be much earlier than the time that it is actually published on chain. And the congestion could be much different and the fees could be much different. So, um, in order to allow the party to publish a, 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 a relevant fee that corresponds to the current network conditions, it is very useful for, uh, for uh, this feature is very useful so that the party cannot be locked to a past fee that is too small to prevent bribing. So, this wraps up our presentation. Um, so, as a recap, we defined the time lock game and which, um, which models time lock bribing attacks. Then we proved and we described the time lock uh, uh, theorem, which uh, explains when it is beneficial for uh, miners to ignore um, a currently valid transaction in favor of one that will be uh, valid in the future after its time lock expires. Then we analyzed DMC channels, both in the uh, simple version without the tree and in the complex version with the tree. And we, we then proposed an improvement to DMC channels with a small change in their script, in uh, which we dub suburb channels. And we also performed an analysis there and we uh, came up with the result that the range of useful fees that are safe from bribing is much larger for the suburb channels and the amount of coins that have to remain on in the channel to prevent bribing can be as much as 30 times lower than in DMC channels. And um, then we moved on our analysis to uh, lightning channels, which we showed uh, the range of values that it's secure and we proposed a minor change in the fee payout in order to improve the um, the active, the useful range, and we also proposed specific um, rules that parties have to check, uh, that Lightning nodes can uh, actively um, um, check against, in order to make bribing uh, rationally impossible uh, for their counterparty. So thank you very much for your attention.